Testing, testing, can you hear me? All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be uh, back here in the main hall. I was hoping that we weren't speaking in this hall, actually. Uh, I'd much rather speak in one of the classrooms because it's, it's much better for conversation and questions and answers. Um, so this is probably going to be a little bit more formal than we had up in the classrooms upstairs. Uh, but um, for this session now and uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to be looking at um, really how do we experience God on a personal level. So um, are, are we recording this, brothers, at the back? Is this, is this streaming? Yes, all right. So we're screaming. <coughs> Sorry, streaming, not screaming. So... Uh, Good day, y'all. It's good to be here with you all. And um, my name is Conrad Vine. I work in Berrien Springs with Adventist Frontier Missions. And it's my privilege to be sharing um, these few days with you out here in South Africa. Um, I was hoping for a bit of sun out here, but unfortunately that is not the case. Um, but it's good to be with you all today. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some practical ways by w in which we can experience God in our lives. Um, I think that um, uh, for many of us, this is one of the biggest challenges we face as Christians. Actually, how do we experience God in our lives? How do we know that God is speaking with us? How do we sense God's shaping? How do we hear his voice of calm or his voice of rebuke? And so um, <clears throat> today, um, we're going to be having an hour and a bit together. And tomorrow, we have two sessions. Um, today, these are, this is my, um, I'm not a very good teacher. So that's my class plan laid out, Okay just general topics to cover. So um, for our, I'm going to start off today by speaking about a couple of devotional habits. Um, I'm going to talk about fasting and spending time alone with God and also about our hunger for God. Uh, tomorrow morning we're going to speak about the devotional habit of praise. Uh, praise does not lift us into the presence of God. It makes us more aware of, more aware of his presence all around us. And it, and it takes us out of this world, you might say, we're going to talk about the habits of having a spiritual companion, someone you can trust. What does it mean to walk with somebody else and to mediate the presence of God to them, particularly in times of crisis. We're going to be talking about some um, lessons from nature, how we see lessons in nature around us. And we're going to be talking a bit about um, biblical meditation. And then in the second hour tomorrow, we're going to be covering what we just covered in the last hour up in the classrooms. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, what the, the, the scriptures and Sister White say about biblical meditation. How do you meditate on scripture? Um, in our fundamental beliefs, uh, number 11, growing in Christ, we say that we grow through feeding on his word and, and meditation on his works and on his word. But nowhere do we define how do you meditate on the word of God. So we're going to talk about two different ways to meditate on the word of God uh, tomorrow in the second hour together. Um, when I talk about these things, I just emphasize that God has created each one of us to be unique, and God speaks to us in different ways. And so God speaks to some people through the, the praise time in church. God speaks to some people through the testimony time. Um, God speaks to some people through the sermons. And, so, and sometimes God speaks to us through the fellowship, uh, through the, through the, the potluck. Um, if it's, um, if it's um, haystacks, it's probably not a very good word from God. But... Um, <laughs> But God speaks to us in different ways. And it's important for us to recognize that because we are unique, that, that just because God speaks to somebody through the study of Scripture doesn't mean that God has to speak to you in the same way. That God will speak to you maybe through nature when you go out and when you walk. So um, we're not talking here about you know, this is how you hear God speak, like this is the plan for how it works. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some ingredients. There are different ingredients into what constitutes the spiritual life. And some of those ingredients mean more to some people than to others. Um, so uh, but let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit's presence among us today. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege and the freedom we have here in South Africa to gather here today. I thank you, Father, for the love you showed each one of us in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you have taken us from our past and you brought us to the present. And Father, we look forward by faith not just to what happens in this life, but to that glorious day when Jesus comes again and all things are made new again. And so, Father, as we walk through life's um, uh, often um, sad and lonely path, we're asking today that as we, as we reflect on how you speak to us, that we will hear your voice speaking to our hearts, that we will hear you shaping us, um, encouraging us, comforting us, rebuking us, but ultimately, Father, completing the good work 
that you've begun in each of our hearts and minds and souls. So Father, we give this next um, hour into your hands. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, um, we're just going to start out with a short personal testimony, because most preachers start out with personal testimonies, and allows people to see them as kind of more than a cardboard cutout figure, okay? So, I just want to start out with a personal experience of how God shaped me in one area of my life. And it happened um, about 12, 13 years ago. Um, I was serving, I won't say where, um, but because um, this is being streamed live, okay? So I'm not going to say where this happened. But um, I lost my job. And it was a very, very bitter experience for me. I had to go and clean out my desk at about 11 o'clock at night. And um, I was with some local guys in a certain country. We just watched Liverpool beat Chelsea in the Champions League semi final. Um, which was a big deal in that country because everybody watched the Champions League, the guys in that, in that country. And I got home and I got a call that said, go and clean your desk out, you're fired. And I said, you know, 11 o'clock at night? And said, yes, clean it out. So I went and cleaned it out and I lost my home. I couldn't pay for my mortgage. And I lost my job. And as a guy, when your job is kind of ripped away from you, it kind of takes a lot of your identity away from you. And so um, I was praying with my, fasting with my wife about where we were going to serve. And uh, we were, said, the church said, you can go and serve in, in Britain or in Ireland or in Minnesota. And I really didn't want to go to America. I have no interest in going to America. It wasn't in our life plan at all. And so we said, okay, we'll probably go back to England and serve in the pastoral ministry. Um, but as we were praying and fasting, we said, God, we need to know where you want us to go. And um, eventually we were told, that, no, it's not going to work out in Britain. It's not going to work out in Ireland and uh, the Minnesota conference president called me and said, we really need uh, some more pastors in Minnesota. Would you please come to Minnesota? Now, where I was living, the temperature was about 40 Celsius. Where I was going, it drops to minus 40 Celsius. This is a big change in temperature. And so, um, in where the hot part of the world where I was, you carry gloves in the car because when you put your fingers on the steering wheels, they kind of roast them alive, okay? You kind of have, you have um, burgers and your hands are kind of roasted there. Where I was going, you carry gloves in the car, not because of the heat, but because if you go off the road, you'll freeze to death during the night. I mean, it, it's very cold in northern Minnesota. So we went to northern Minnesota, and I was pastoring, and I loved pastoring. I was, it was one of the greatest privileges of life to be a pastor. And you get to walk with people through the highs and lows of life. It's an incredible experience. And uh, even though I was pastoring, we had a lot of baptisms, we had three churches, they were all growing, I actually went into this deep depression, like this really long, chronic depression. And depression was combined with anger. Actually, if you have anger in your life and you don't deal with it, it often manifests itself as depression. Internalized anger turns itself into depression. And so I had this deep depression, and I was a pastor, and pastors aren't supposed to be depressed, are they? But I had this terrible depression, well, I was physically present, but emotionally absent for about two years in the home. Okay? I didn't remember on my wife's birthday. I don't anyway, but now I had a great excuse. I didn't remember our wedding anniversary. I don't anyway, but I had a great excuse. Nowadays, my secretary has it in her calendar, and she sends me an email a week before our wedding anniversary and says, don't forget. Okay? And um, Last time, she sent me an email on the day, and I still forgot. So I... Um, <clears throat> I experienced grace later that evening when I got home. So um, I went through this deep anger, this deep depression, and I'm a stubborn kind of guy. I said, no, I'm not going to go to the doctor. Uh, I'm just going to walk this off. So I started walking in the morning, and that kind of helped a bit, but I still have this deep anger and depression. And so eventually I turned to God in despair. I said, God, you know, if, if I need you to heal me because this isn't right. How can I be a pastor and leading people to Jesus if I'm suffering from this deep internal depression and anger. This isn't right. And I need you to heal me. And only you can heal me. Because this is a sickness of my soul. This isn't a medical problem. This is a, a spiritual problem. So um, I started reading through the Psalms. And I would look at the first Psalm. The first verse. And um, I started chewing over the scripture. This is a kind of biblical meditation. You'll hear more about it tomorrow. And I started asking. You know, I'd, I'd read a verse and I'd say, what does this verse tell me about God? And I'd ask myself that question, and then God would reveal things to me. Well, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That tells me that I have a shepherd. And here am I angry and depressed, but God is telling me that, Conrad, you have a shepherd, and your shepherd is God, and God is the good shepherd. So why are you, why are you upset if you have a good shepherd? The good shepherd leads his sheep by still waters and still, pa and still green pastures. So the first thing I'd ask is, what does this verse tell me about God? 
and then I sit and think about it. And um, the second question is, what does this verse tell me about myself? And I'd sit and think about that. Well, if the Lord is my shepherd, that means I am a, a sheep. Okay, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a father, I'm not a husband, I am a sheep. And sheep are not as intelligent animals as they think they are, yes? Sheep tend to smell a bit. They kind of wallow in their own, you know, matter and urine and, and they get their, their, their flesh, get their, 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 um, their wool gets stained. When sheep cut themselves, can they heal themselves? No. When a sheep cuts himself on barbed wire, you need a shepherd to bandage up that wound and put some oil into it. All that sheep has a permanent scar in their body and it takes, uh, sometimes it never heals. And so, if the Lord is my shepherd, that means I'm a sheep. By implication, I'm not as smart as I think I am. I'm not as intelligent as I think I am. I've probably wandered away from God somewhere in the past. Now I've got scars in my body and I need the good shepherd to heal me because I can't heal myself. Does this make sense? So the third question was, um, the first question, what does this verse tell me about God? Second question is, what does this verse tell me about myself? And the third question was, so what is God asking of me in this text? As I worked through the, the Psalms, the different, different answers came to my mind. So if the Lord is my shepherd, then maybe God is asking me, whose voice are you listening to in life? Whose voice are you following? Are you listening to the voice of the good shepherd? Or are you following another voice in your life? Maybe you're for, following the voice of the conference of your peers. You're following peer pressure. Maybe you're following the voice of your mother-in-law. I hope not, but if you are, good luck to you. Whose voice are you following in life? Okay. Um, maybe I need to start listening to the good shepherd. Or maybe, Lord, I, I no longer know what the good shepherd's voice sounds like. Maybe I've, my spiritual experience is so dry, I no longer recognize when God is speaking to me. Maybe God is saying, Conrad, I need you to repent of what happened in the past and to, to covenant with me to actually follow my word as you read my will every day in the Psalms. There are multiple answers to these questions. And each day, God was impressing something upon my heart now, in Minnesota, the snow gets nice and deep, okay? And it's great from a pastoral perspective because when you say to somebody between October and May, will you be home on Thursday at 7 o'clock? You know they're going to be home on Thursday at 7 o'clock. If you're a pastor in Florida, everybody's out playing golf or tennis or something like that. But in Minnesota, right up by the Canadian border, people go to work and they come home and they hunker down and they ain't going anywhere because the drive on the roads at minus 30 with wind chill if you go off the road, the wind chill will kill you in the car. I mean, it is, it is a serious matter. So, uh, when I, the, the snow is kind of like this deep in Minnesota, and about March, the sun starts to reappear again. And um, what I discovered was that, um, th that when, when the sun gently bathes the snow every morning, the snow doesn't seem to melt from the top, it melts from the bottom. And the snowpack always looks smooth on the top, no matter how much sun is out there. All that happens is the snowpack gradually goes down. So day by day, I was reading the scriptures and dealing with this depression, this anger. And anger is like electricity running through your body. When you're really angry about something, you go to bed, it's like the anger takes over, and your body kind of twitches with the anger. It's like electricity. It's like this white heat running through your body. And I wasn't sleeping properly, which wasn't helping. But... Um, as I read through the scriptures, it was like as the sun bathes the snow and the snowpack gradually goes down day by day, imperceptibly but day by day, but over the course of a week you notice a change. I realized that as I was allowing the sun of righteousness to bathe my soul day by day each morning, that God was gently melting the ice pack on my heart. And then one day I woke up and I realized I'd slept the whole night without a break. And that's kind of a miracle. And I realized that, oh, the anger has gone. And, oh, the, where's the depression gone? I mean, it, it's gone. And the depression just kind of lifted. I know this isn't everybody's experience. I'm just giving my testimony to start off here. The depression had gone. And I was really upset about this because when you have chronic depression, eventually it becomes like a friend that you hate. It's a friend that you love to hate. And it's a friend that you hate to love. But it's a friend nonetheless. And when the depression is gone, you think, oh, where is it? You know, where's my friend depression gone? And the depression was gone. I thought, no, no, something's wrong here. So I started replaying in my mind all the events that led up to the depression, hoping for depression to suddenly reappear, and the depression did not reappear. It was gone. And the anger was gone. And I was like, no, 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 anger is a friend. Because when you have anger, you justify your behavior. Like, I'm a victim. Somebody did to me, something to me in the past. That, that justifies my behavior to do to, for you today. And I don't want to use that, lose that moral excuse for my behavior. So where's my anger gone? But the anger was gone. 
And just as the sun melts the ice pack little by little every day, so by encountering God every day in the Psalms, where every human emotion is present, vengeance, revenge, hatred, joy, bitterness, forgiveness, hope, peace, where every human emotion is present in the Psalms, over the course of two years, God had melted the ice pack on my heart. And I woke up one day, and the depression was gone, and I praised God for that. And so I started to become interested in how do people grow closer to God? Because many people, and this is not a criticism, but it's a description, many people enter the body of Christ on a spiritual diet of horns and dates and beasts and crowns. That's how we enter the church. But then we never grow beyond that. And we enter with fear. Women particularly have fear in my experience. We enter with fear and 20 years later we're still crippled by fear. Or we enter with lust and 10 years later we're still crippled by lust. We enter with um, a lack of peace in our hearts, a deep sense of uncertainty. And we're we're worried about the future. And 10 years later in the body of Christ we've, we've had no character transformation whatsoever. And I started seeing this more and more in my members that that the pillars of the church were wrestling with just as many character issues as were the new, the new converts. So where was this sanctification? Where was this shaping process of God in people's lives? Now, does this ring a bell with anybody? Yes? Does any of this ring true to your experience? Yes? And maybe not, some of you are nodding, some of you are not. But um, I'm just sharing how I became interested in how we have a personal walk with God because I saw the miracle that God worked in my life. And I decided to kind of focus my reading and studies in this area because as a pastor, I wanted to help my members also experience the peace that only God can give. I wanted my members to experience victory over fear and victory over lust and victory over bitterness and victory over sorrow and victory over um, helplessness. And many people have that within our church. We look great on Sabbath morning, but if you go to any house in the church, Behind every front door, there is a story to tell, and there is a wound in somebody's heart. So, it doesn't matter whether you drive a Ford or a Ferrari, people still cry, okay? And so, um, as, a, as a pastor, a minister of the gospel, I wanted to know, how can I help people experience the goodness and the grace of God in a way that heals their hearts and allows them to hear God speaking to them personally? And so, that's kind of been, you know, a lot of focus of my life in the last few years, and... Um, <clears throat> So, uh, that's kind of a, by way of introduction. Um, in the West, Western Christianity, um, Orthodox Christianity is slightly different, okay? Um, Orthodox Christianity has what we call the smells and the bells, um, because when the Orthodox Church split off from the Western Church, they stopped growing theologically. The, the Orthodox Church says that until the whole body of Christ is united, when all the bishops come together, then we can define theology together. But because the Orthodox is separated, they, they say we can't grow theologically, so they grow experientially with God. That's why the Orthodox, you go to an Orthodox church, you see the, the beautiful frescoes on the roof, and you smell the incense, and you hear the beautiful music, the chanting of the monks, and um, you taste things, and you touch, and you see the gold and the silver. The Orthodox church focuses on the experience of God because they don't grow theologically, because until the churches come together, they can't grow theologically. But in the West... We have defined Christianity not by how we hear God speak, but we've defined Christianity by creedal statements. So we have the Westminster Confession, the 39 Articles, the Augsburg Confession. In the Adventist Church, we have the 28 Fundamental Beliefs, which we say are not a creed, but to anybody looking in, it looks suspiciously like a creed, but we say it's not a creed. But, um, so we have boiled down Christianity to a set of intellectual and cognitive statements. I believe this. This is hard for us to experience, understand as missionaries, because if you say, what do Buddhists believe? If you're working in a Buddhist country, and you say, what do Buddhists believe? Your average Buddhist doesn't know what they believe. A better question is, how do you experience Buddhism? Okay? And how they experience Buddhism is a much more meaningful question than what do you believe? Because they're kind of all over the map with what they believe. But in our Christian life, We have defined Christianity with our intellect, with our cognitive thought processes, with neatly defined statements of belief, and we've persecuted people and we've burnt them at the stake, and we've um, excommunicated and disfellowshipped because you don't quite adhere to these intellectual statements. We've defined our Christian experience as an intellectual experience. 
And so, if you go to Europe, you have these beautiful cathedrals, and in the cathedrals you have dead bodies. Yeah, have you noticed that? The cathedrals are filled with the dead. And in our Western Christendom, I'm not just talking about Adventism here, but in general in our Western Christianity, we build these cathedrals of thought, it's called systematic theology. And we have these beautiful systematic theologies, but sitting in the pews we have people, and that systematic theology means almost nothing to them. And they yearn to hear the voice of God, and that systematic theology means diddly squat to them. Is that an expression you have here? Yep. Diddly squat yep. means like nothing. It's not a bad expression, is it? No. It's not a crude expression here. Okay, I just want to make sure. I was with my wife once in Minnesota, and I said, we're visiting this lady and her wife, and I said, you know, you're a very homey lady, you know. It's, which is, and in the English word, it means that you, you make a great, you're a great homemaker, you're a very gracious host, the delicious food. And she looked at me in horror, like, homey? I said, yeah, you're a homey person. The husband said, homey? Uh, and I realized, oh, I said the wrong thing here. I said, what I mean is that you're a gracious host, and it's just a joy to come to your house. She said, well, in America, you're, you're saying I'm kind of like old and you know, beyond marriageable, marriageable age, and uh, like I'm kind of like on the, on, on the downward slope to retirement and the grave, I mean, it's, and a few other more unflattering comments as well. So, um, anyway, in our Western Christianity, we have leaned towards a rational, an intellectual, and a cognitive experience, an explanation of Scripture and its interpretation. We value degrees of learning rather than personal transformation. Um, if you want to have a job at Helderberg as a theology professor, nowhere on any Adventist college, I know you're here, I'm sorry I'm about to say this, but this is true, even for a pastor, nowhere do we ask for character transformation as a condition of employment in the church. We say, if you want to be a professor of theology, you must have a terminal degree, but nowhere do we say we want to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life as a basic requirement of that job. You can be a pastor and you have to get your BA, then your MA or your MDiv, but nowhere do we say explicitly that to be a pastor, we need to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So we value degrees of learning, but we don't really talk about character transformation, even as we're asking who's going to serve in the church. What I've discovered as I've gone through Scripture is that um, as I was meditating my way through the Psalms, what I discovered there is that not only do I have a hunger for God, but God has a hunger for me. That God wants to meet with us. And when, you, when you're learning to kind of chew over the scriptures in the morning, and you may set your alarm clock for 10 minutes, or then you set it for 20 minutes, then you set it for half an hour, it's, it's like, you know, you get these um, like serials on the TV, where they always end on a cliffhanger every half hour of episodes. You discover in the scripture there's always a cliffhanger that God wants you back. He wants to say something to you that he hasn't finished with you yet. And so you discover as we chew our way through our scripture that, yes, we have a hunger for God, but God has a hunger for us. Um, if you have, um, I have a teenage boy, and when he became a teenager, he, his, his vocabulary turned to monosyllabic grunts. Any of you experienced the same thing with teenage boys? Okay. Yeah, he grunts. Like, uh. And what does uh mean? Well, David, did you have a good day? Uh. Well, did you have a good day? Uh-huh. You may get two grunts if you're lucky. And um, I know, as a father with a teenage boy, the sheer joy in my heart when I get a text from my teenage boy. Any of you experienced that? When a teenager sends you an email or sends you a text, oh, they've remembered me, and they're not asking for money. Isn't that nice? Okay? <clears throat> but just as we want to talk with our Heavenly Father, so just as we yearn to hear from our children, God yearns to hear from us. So this hunger works both ways. God wants to hear from us, just as much as we want to hear from him. So what we're going to be talking about now is, um, is various ways uh, in which we can experience God's presence, ways in which um, we can partner intentionally with God. You know, God, some, if, if we lead really busy lives and we, and we never have our personal devotions, sometimes God has to speak to us through a megaphone, like a road accident. Okay? When I broke my leg in the Rockies, my wife wasn't sympathetic to me, all right? She said, Corin, she said, God is slowing you down. He wants you to lie on your back for a number of months here. This is good for you. Enjoy it. Lie on your back. She says, you can't go to work. The doctor says, you have to be off work for six weeks. I said, that's not going to happen. So I got this Dragon software where you dictate. Doctors have it for medical records. 
and now you can get it for Word and Excel. So I was lying on my bed at home with my leg up, with my laptop on my chest, dictating emails all day. My wife was so frustrated with me. She said, you were supposed to take time off from work. I said, no, no, with this software, I can still work with my legs high in the air. So how did we get onto that, by the way? Mm, okay. Um, yes, slowing down. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is the first devotional habit is slowing down and taking time with God. Uh, is this making sense so far as we're talking through this? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the first devotional habit we're going to talk about is slowing down and spending time with God. Now, um, we lead really busy lives, and, but the reality is, I'm going to quote Bonhoeffer here. Bonhoeffer said this, he said, We are so afraid of silence that we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order not to have to spend a moment alone with ourselves, in order not to look at ourselves in the mirror. We don't like silence in the West. We prefer to be human doings rather than human beings. We hate silence because silence is unproductive, but even worse than that, when we slow down and we're silent, the, 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 the garbage in our lives starts rearing its ugly head. We can, we can be really busy because we're running from the pain of the past. We can be really busy because we don't want to face up to the fact that there's a broken relationship that needs restoration. We can be really busy because we don't want to talk to our children for whatever reason. We can be really busy because we don't want to face our wife about something. So oftentimes in the West, we, we, we busy, we're busy, busy, busy. We rush through life, not so much because we like what we're doing, but because we're afraid of what we might have to deal with if we slow down. And so when we travel, we have iPods. When we go to the gym, we put iPods in, uh, the earphones in our ears. Um, when we go on a plane, we read a book or we watch a movie. Um, when we get home at night, most people when they get home at night, the first thing they do is switch on the TV because they don't want to be alone in the house. When people get in the car, other than switching on the engine, most people turn on the radio because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts. Okay? So um, every part of our life is inundated with words. We have trivial words, angry words, rushed words, um, hurtful words, religious words. And so we learn to skim our way through life. So um, I learned at college there are certain ways to read a book really quickly because if, if the lecturer says, I want you to read this textbook, then I say, I'm not going to waste all the time reading 400 pages. Are you crazy? Now, my, life, my time is too precious for that. So we learn how to skim read through a book. So if you want to read through a book quickly, read the introduction, not even the first chapter. Read the introduction and read the concluding chapter. Okay? Not if you're an orthopedic surgeon. Okay? <laughs> But any other profession in life where you, need to, where you can skip over like, the mechanics of it, you read the introduction and you read the concluding chapter, and then if you really have to read it, then you read the first sentence of every paragraph, because the key idea of every paragraph is in the first sentence. So you, you go from first paragraph to the first sentence, to the next paragraph to the first sentence, and you can get through 400 pages in under an hour. I've done it many times. And then you've read the book. We look for bullet points, bold points, and summaries. We ask people to get to the point. We hate it when people just ramble on and on and on. And when they're not saying anything important, we block them out so that we can drown in our internal flow of words. Words and yet more words. But when we slow down and we're on our own, we notice things that we prefer to avoid. Things like anger, loneliness, bitterness, fear, and impatience. And yet we sense that we're wasting our time and this is a painful experience. And yet this is an invitation to prayer from God. And so the habit of getting alone with God is really a foundational habit of hearing God speak in our lives. Um, God may speak to you when you're playing you know, on the wing for the spring box or scrum half. You may get a blinding revelation as you're playing you know, the wallabies. The chances are that he's not going to speak to you at that moment. The chances are God is going to speak to you when you slow down. And you have the courage to slow down. And you have the courage to put your electronic nipple away, your iPhone or your iPod or your laptop. You put your electronic nipple to one side because you're not going to suck on it for half an hour and you actually spend time with God. When we slow down, it allows us to disengage from the interruptions of life and it prepares us to engage with our Heavenly Father. When we slow down, the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. You might paraphrase that this way that says, if you are still, then you will know that I am God. When we slow down, it allows God to nurture depth in our spiritual experience. We all just skip along the surface in life. 
we want to know, if you go to a website, the most commonly visited part of any website is FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, yes? We all go there because we want to know what the important stuff is on that website. We don't want to waste our time reading everything else. We go to the FAQ. But when we slow down with God, we allow God to nurture depth. We actually have time to sit and think. When we slow down and spend time with God, God nurtures a reflective spirit. We actually learn to ask questions about ourselves and to ask questions about God. We become reflective in all areas of our lives. When we slow down and spend time with God, the promise of Isaiah is that in quietness and trust is your strength. When we slow down, we start to hear the voice of God like maybe never before, and we sense God's nurturing hand in our hearts and in our lives. And when we slow down and spend time with God, we're following the example of Jesus. Mark 4, 1 says, In the morning while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. So even though I know we're all very busy people, it's important for us, if we want to really allow God to shape our lives and to hear God speaking, we need to slow down and spend time intentionally with God. And if you're not intentional about this, it doesn't happen. It's like going for a jog. If you're not intentional about going for a jog, guess what? You won't go for a jog. Okay, so you have to be intentional about this because um, the world and your family life presses all these legitimate requirements in your time upon you, but you have to carve time out in your day to spend time with God. So in practice, what does this mean? Well, um, is, some people say, is it better to spend time with God in the morning or in the evening? And my answer is, well, when are you most awake? Like some people are morning birds and some people are night owls, yes? I heard somebody say you're either a fowl or an owl, yes? That's an expression here. I've heard it a few times. Some people are either fowls or owls. Um, I'm wide awake in the morning, okay? I like getting up at 5 o'clock. Between 5 and 6.30 is the most precious time of the day to me. That is gold. And please don't interfere with it. And thankfully, my kids are all asleep at that time and so is my wife. I just praise God my family are asleep in those early hours of the morning because I have the house to myself. There's quietness in the house. And uh, so if you are a morning person, then carve time out in the morning. That means that you may have to go to bed half an hour early in the evening. So you can still have the sleep you need. But this is a devotional habit. And as soldiers in the army, we have to be disciplined about our walk with God. And so carving out time in the morning may mean that you have to go to bed a little bit earlier at night. Uh, I don't suffer from weakness for alcohol, for instance, but I do suffer from discouragement when I'm tired. Satan attacks me when I'm tired. That the thought that there's the, the accusations like, this is never going to work, okay? It's lonely being a leader of an organization. This is never going to work. That happens when I'm tired. So I know that. So I go to bed at a reasonably early hour. I'm in bed and sleep before 10 o'clock normally because I know that's my best defense against Satan's attacks. It also prepares me to be up early in the morning to spend time with God. So when we spend time with God, my suggestion is this. Um, unplug all your electronic or electrical devices. Okay, if you, your average cell phone in the morning, when you get up in the morning, I switch on my phone, or it's, it's beside me all night, and I look at the screen, and there's maybe three friend requests from Facebook, there's 20 Instagram messages, there's a few WhatsApp messages, there's 15 Gmail messages come through, um, there's a few um, news flashes from the BBC, or whoever it may be, and, and there's, there's, that, there's this stream of electronic data coming through to me. And if I sit down at my desk at home, you know, at my home office, which is not that big, but I call it my office, you know, it's a grandiose title for a desk, okay? And my home office, I sit down in my home office, and if I have my cell phone right next to me, every time there's a WhatsApp message, it goes beep. Every time there's a message, it says beep. Every time a, a Gmail comes in, it goes beep. Every time there's a news flash, there's, a, there's, a, there's bells and sirens going off. And I've come to realize that if you want to spend time with God, you need to turn that electronic off that gadget off, turn it off, and to put it away. Because it will constantly interrupt your time with God. We have to give God our full attention as we engage with him. Um, turn off your computer, turn off your electronic gadgets. Um, we're all fixated with time in the morning. Um, you know, when we get up in our house and the kids get up, every second is spoken for. Is that like in your houses? You've got to get the kids to school. You have to leave the house at 7.20 in our house. You have to be in the car by 7.23. You know, you walk out into the garage to the car. If the kids have got to be in the car by 7.23, the shoes have got to be on and the bags on their shoulders by 7.22. Okay, and the kids know this, and we know this. And if they've got to be, 
You've got to hose them and, you know, hose them down and wash them and feed them and dress them in the morning. Now, that's, that takes a process. And as my girl gets older, so the time in the shower gets longer, I've discovered that as well. So we have, there's this constant battle with time in the morning. And so when you're spending time with God, you don't want to be worrying like, what's the time, what's the time? So what I do at home is I take an alarm clock and I set it for, let's say, half an hour's time. And I put it on the floor behind me and I set the alarm to go off in half an hour. Okay? That means I can focus on the text if I'm reading a passage of scripture. And I never have to look at the clock in that half an hour because I know the alarm is going to go off. I can actually focus on my time with God. The alarm will go off in half an hour. It's not going to fall asleep on me. That means that I can focus on my time with God, knowing that when the alarm goes off, that's it. And I don't have to keep looking at my watch or my cell phone. Because if I keep checking my cell phone, guess what I'm going to see at the same time? Facebook messages and instant messages and emails coming through and somebody's not coming in because it's snowy in the morning and is this okay? And they want to know and you feel obliged to say yes or no to them and so forth. So um, to spend time alone with God, I put an alarm clock behind me it just allows me to focus on my time with God and not worry about where the time is. Now, sometimes um, Satan puts distracting thoughts into your mind. Um, you get up in the morning and you know you've got a difficult phone call to make that day and you're kind of thinking, praying about it. But those thoughts kind of trouble you. Then suddenly, out of left field, this thought comes to you that says, oh, um, you need to book your son's driving lessons because my boy's now 16. And instead of thinking about it now, and like, well, I need to go to the website and find out how to do this, um, you just let that, you don't follow that thought. You just, the thought enters your mind, you just let it be and let it go. You don't follow that thought. You don't act upon that thought. Um, if you try and like hammer it and knock it down, it will reappear like a mole, okay? You, yeah. if you, do you deal with moles in your gardens here? Yeah, they come up here, and you kind of hammer them down, then they come up somewhere else and you hammer them down. And, so you're playing whack-a-mole. So no, you don't want to do that. You, as the thoughts come to your mind, you just let them, just let them float away. Um, you don't want them to kind of take over your time with God. And you will soon discover that if you're not spending time with God now in the best time of the day, and for me it's in the morning, um, you may start out with five minutes and you'll soon discover that five minutes is not enough. And then you'll move it to ten minutes. And you're a busy person, but you manage to carve out those ten minutes. And then you find out that ten minutes is not enough, so you move on to fifteen minutes. Because you're discovering that God is changing your spiritual taste buds the more you spend time intentionally with him and you're discovering his hunger for you and his love for you at the same time and so then it, 15 minutes becomes 20 then 25 then 30 and before you know it my wife is like calling from the kitchen like are you going to get ready today Conrad I say, oh sorry sorry okay because you're spending time with God and that is the most precious season of the day so the first devotional habit we're talking about is spending time alone with God and if you forget everything else from what I've been saying, then the most important message is this. If you're not intentional about this, it won't happen. You have to carve out that time. If you're not going to set your alarm clock that half hour earlier and go to bed half an hour earlier, it's not going to happen. Okay? The reality of getting up in the morning will just overwhelm you. And then your family will be upset with you because you're not pulling your full share, fair share of the chores to get everybody out of the door on time. So the first devotional habit we'll talk about is spending time alone with God. You have to be intentional about this. And um, I've just given a few practical tips on this. Um, uh, one of my colleagues in the office called John Baxter at AFM, when he has his devotional time with God in the morning, he sings his way through the hymnal. He doesn't read the scriptures. He sings his way through the hymnal. Okay? That's how God speaks to him. Um, you know, and um, Charles Wesley's songs, there's a profound theology in that. Um, was it, um, was it, was it, what's the song? Um, Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? See from his side, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? These beautiful words, they're poetic. And, and as he sings these words to himself, he sings his way through the hymnal, um, that there's a profound theology in many of those songs. So he just sings to himself. He makes a joyful noise, not a harmonious noise. I know that from morning worship in the office, but uh, he, he sings his way through the hymnal. And as he sings, music reaches parts of you that words cannot. Music has a physiological response, and it, and it goes past your critical faculties of your brain, um, and it, reach, it reaches into your innermost beings in a way that a talk like this cannot and never will do. 
So he sings his way through the hymnal, and that the words of the hymnal are profound. So the first devotional habit I just want to talk about today is spending time alone with God. And um, does anybody have any comments or questions on what we've covered so far? You just raise your hand and speak up. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Conrad. Mm-hmm. I read electronically, um, and there are many uh, things that irritate me, like email and this and mm-hmm. that. And in this country, you have to to get your morning data. You have to do it before five, and that's pretty irritating too, to set everything up to start downloading or whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. But my question is, when you are reading and the thought comes to you, do you then... Uh, I have a to-do list and I write it down. Do you do that or do you just say it'll come back? No, if it's important, it'll come back. I don't write. When when in my my morning devotions, I don't don't write down anything for work, anything for the family. That's just between myself and God. And I don't don't have anything else to intrude into that time. And then it becomes a very rich time. I mean, just imagine, you know, if I go on a date with my wife and I take her out for a meal... And I'm sitting there, and, and there are these, these, my work colleagues are calling me for an urgent discussion. You know, I spend the date on urgent discussions on the phone. How's my wife going to feel? And so, um, God is my creator, and an act of worship to him is actually dedicating time to him. And so, I don't, I don't follow up those thoughts as they come to me. And there's time in the day for that. If it's important, God will bring it to remembrance. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? How many of you, oh, I won't show, ask for a show of hands, but I just encourage you to, if you're not doing this already, to be intentional about this, this, this time with God. Um, because it's really how God speaks to us in many ways. Okay, so the next devotional habits I want to talk about is the habit of fasting. And um, if you have your Bibles with you, um, I invite you to turn to Second Chronicles 7 verse 14. Okay, thank you. So, um, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, very, very famous passage of scripture, and it says there, "If my people, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, who are called by my name, humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land." It's a beautiful promise, yes. It's in the dedication of the temple. Now, that phrase to humble yourself is linked with the verb to fast, okay? And fasting and prayer go side by side in the scriptures. I mean, Jesus says in Matthew 20, 17 about the demons, he says, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. And so um, in this passage here, we read that God promises that when his people humble themselves, and to humble yourself, a physical expression of humility before God is to fast, and they pray... And they seek my face and they turn or repent of their wicked ways. God will hear, he will forgive, and God will heal. It's a beautiful promise of God. And so um, prayer and fasting go side by side in the Bible. And so um, why do prayer and fasting go side by side? Well, how much time do you spend preparing food in the day, eating the food, cleaning up after the food, and feeling drowsy after the food? How much time do you spend in the day doing all this? Like half an hour? No. An hour? Yeah, so people get an hour's lunch break at work maybe, but you have breakfast and maybe you have an evening meal. Let's say the average person spends two hours a day, would that be a fair estimate? On food preparation, the eating of the food. You know, food preparation is 59 minutes in my household. When my wife puts a meal in front of me, the food eating takes you know, one minute. And then then I have to rush back to work, okay? Does that ring a bell with any guys here? Does does your wife ever chastise you for having 32 bites in the meal rather than 32 bites in the mouthful? Well, I get chastised about that because I I wolf it down. My wife says, did you like the meal? And I have to look at her plate to remind myself what it was I just ate. I'm not really interested in variety. I just want carbs for energy, okay? I'm kind of a typical, you know, I act like a beast when it comes to food, I guess. So... um, But if you spend two hours a day in food preparation and eating and cleaning up afterwards, and you say, I have no time to pray on a particular problem, 
Well, if you fast, you've just created two hours in the day to pray. In the middle of a busy schedule, you've just created two hours to pray. Does that make sense? You may say, I'm a busy person, I run a business, I'm a teacher, I'm an accountant, I'm an engineer, I'm a professor, I'm a music teacher. My day is all spoken for, but you, you eat in the day. And if you don't eat in that day, you've suddenly created time to pray. So fasting and prayer, they actually, they complement you, they go side by side. If you want to spend more time in devoted prayer, then fast. You know, if, if, you, if you want to, if you're, not, if you're not able to fast all day, then you may go without your midday meal. And if you get time at work for lunch, then you spend that time in prayer. Because that is time that's supposed to be for eating. So fasting and prayer go side by side. And the passage I want to focus on particularly is Isaiah 58. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, where Isaiah, or God through Isaiah, speaks about the spiritual fruit of fasting. <clears throat> and um, we tend to think of fasting as, you know, you just don't eat. And um, we're not sure what the benefit of this is, but... Uh, uh, sometimes we fast in order to lose weight but in Isaiah 58 we discover that there are spiritual fruit of fasting so we'll pick it up in verse 3 these are the people of Israel they're saying why do we fast to God they're saying to God why do we fast but why do you not see why do we humble ourselves it's a parallel idea fasting and humbling ourselves it's the same idea why do we humble ourselves but you do not notice look says God you serve your own interests on your fast day, and you oppress all your workers. Look, says God, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. And so the people of Israel, they're fasting, they're going through the ritual of religion, but it's not changing their hearts. Um, generally speaking, uh, my wife has learnt... I keep talking about my wife, okay, but this is a good example. My wife has learnt that if she's, you know, reversed the car into a pillar, not to tell me before I have my evening meal. It's better to tell me after I've had my evening meal. Is that a, does that relate to other people's lives? Yes? That if you're a wise wife, you never give bad news before the evening meal. You always give it after the evening meal when you're much, you know, more inclined to hear the bad news. Um, and you're a bit sleepy, so your response is more like a sedated individual. So, uh, in verse 5, it's, God talks about the fasting that God wants. He says, is such a fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So God is not happy with how Israel are fasting. Yes, they're fasting, but there's no spiritual fruit of that fasting. The only fruit there is, is antagonism and violence within the body of Christ. So what is the fruit of fasting that God wants? And fasting is not just to lower your blood pressure, though that helps. It's not just to lower your blood triglycerides, though that helps. It's not just to lower your weight, that helps. And those are all good reasons to fast. But there is a spiritual fruit to fasting that we find in verse 6 through 9. It says, is this not the fast that I choose? This is the fast that God wants. It's to loose the bonds of injustice to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healings shall spring up quickly. Your vindicators shall go before you, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here. I am. So this is the spiritual fruit of fasting. So when we talk about fasting, m most Christians have like a negative idea of fasting. Yeah, like we, we're happy to pray, we're happy to read the Bible, but we're kind of reluctant to fast. But here in Isaiah 58, we find that there is spiritual fruit of fasting that God wants us to experience, and this, this is a spiritual harvest that God brings into our life as we humble ourselves before Him. And it's not just forgiveness of sins and the healing of the land, as read in Second Chronicles. Verse 7. So let's go through these one by one. The first is in verse 6. Um, the spiritual fruit of fasting in verse 6 is to loose the bands of wickedness. Some call that the disciples fast from Matthew chapter 17. This is the fast that you would engage in in order to free ourselves from addictions to sin. We're starving our appetite. Physically, we're, controlling our, we're learning to control our appetite. And addictions often have to do with unhealthy appetites. So when we fast, 
we are learning to control our appetite, maybe for the first time. And this enables us, as we control our physical appetite, we're better, to, we're better prepared to control our spiritual appetites. So one of the first fruits of fasting is to loose the bands of wickedness. Some versions say injustice, but I'm using the version here that says um, wickedness. The second fruit of fasting is there in verse 6. It's to undo the thongs of the yoke, or to undo the heavy burdens in the King James. This is the kind of fast that we engage in when we have, we're facing the problem, and we're asking the Holy Spirit's aid to lift the loads we're facing and to overcome the barriers that impede our walk with God. A classic example of this is in Ezra chapter 8, verse 23 where Ezra is going to lead the people of Israel back from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem. He's carrying a lot of temple furniture, gold and silver and bronze, and he's afraid of the bandits that are going to rob them on the way. And so rather than asking the king for an armed guard, he calls for a one-day fast among the people of Israel. That we're going to face a task, there are going to be difficulties in this task, and so we're going to humble ourselves, and we're going to put this, fast, this, this task in God's hands. You see, when you fast, you're saying to God, God... I cannot solve this problem in my own strength. Only you can solve this problem in your strength. So I'm going to physically fast. This is a sign to God that I understand that when this problem is solved, it's not because I am strong, it's because you are strong. And it is because you are able to solve problems and not me. So the physical act of fasting is a spiritual expression of our dependence upon God to lift the burdens that we're facing. Uh, The next fruit of fasting is there. In verse 6, is to let the oppressed go free. Sometimes this is called the Samuel fast. Um, Samuel does this in 1 Samuel chapter 7. When God's people are worshipping other gods, the Ashtoreths and the Baals and, and, the, and the Moleks of the, of, the, of the Canaanites around them, Samuel called for a fast for, pers- for revival among God's people so that they could free themselves from the, the false gods that they were worshipping. And so to let the oppressed go free... If you study the, we don't have time to do this today, but if you study the, um, there's a website called setfreeinchrist.org, which we in AFM set up, talks about deliverance ministry. There's a biblical basis for deliverance ministry in there, and in there I discuss what was idol worship. And idol worship wasn't just the bowing to idols of gold. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that when the pagans bow down to their idols, they're worshipping demons. And all the way through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you find repeated instances of where Moses says that they're worshipping the goat demons. They're not just worshipping idols, but they're worshipping demons. And so when God's people engage in idolatry in in the Old Testament times, they weren't just bowing down to idols of gold or silver, they were worshipping demons. That's why God says idolatry is adultery, because you're leaving me for another spiritual being. You know, what's easier to accept? If your wife gets home home, and there's a letter from your wife says, I don't love you, I'm going back to my mum. That's easier to accept than than a letter that says, I love your best friend, I'm moving in with him, please don't follow after me. Yes? Worshipping idols in the Old Testament times, you can make a very good case, is actually the worshipping of demons. That's why God is so concerned about it. And so one of the fruits of fasting here to let the oppressed go free, we fast in order that we, we, we may free ourselves from the false gods of this world that we may worship God and God alone. Verse 6 is to break every yoke. Another fruit of fasting. This is one of the fruits of fasting here in Isaiah 58 and verse 6. Uh, you might call this the, the Elijah fast. Um, depression can be a yoke for many people. When Elijah was depressed after the Mount uh, Carmel, he ran down to the, the um, Mount Sinai. And what did he do for 40 days? He fasted. He fasted for 40 days and before he could hear God speak to him in the still small voice. But he fasted as a way of breaking the yoke that he was under. So one of the fruits of fasting is, is, we, is to break the spiritual yokes or the mental problems that we are facing, um, the emotional challenges of bitterness or despair or fear or pain. One of the fruits of fasting is that God allows us to overcome the problems that we're facing. In verse 7 you have another fruit of fasting. Uh, it says to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house. And a classic example of this is the widow of Zarephath. Remember that story? Elijah comes along and says, I'm dying of hunger. And she says, I only have oil and flour left for one loaf of bread. I'm going to give it to my son and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, well, can I have that loaf of bread, please? I mean, if the story stopped there, you know, what a selfish monster, yes? 
What a brute. He's a healthy guy. Now, you can go and scavenge for food somewhere else. Just give me your last bread. You can starve to death right now. You, know, you can start the starvation process at noon rather than six o'clock. You, know, you don't need that last meal, yes? Have you noticed that when, well, well, in America, when prisoners have their last meal, they never ask for salad. I, I've noticed that. Um, they always ask for like these 20,000 calorie meals. They're going to pack everything in they possibly can. If they have a burger, and they have some French fries, they have some lemon meringue pie, and they have some shepherd's pie, and they have some candies, and they have some potato crisps, it's their last meal. They're going to have every, tense, every taste sensation they can pack in. And then it takes them half an hour to execute them with the chemicals because they're, you know, they're, they're, all, they're, all this, they're packed full of 20,000 calories. Well, in this case here, the widow's fast is a good example of the fruits of fasting. Um, how does this apply to us? You may be deciding to buy a new car, but there's somebody in your church who can't pay the rent this month. You decide to go without a material possession to bless somebody else in your church. That's a good example of the widow's fast. You, you may literally go without a meal in order to feed somebody else. Uh, you may decide to have two meals out in the month instead of three if you ever eat out so that you can support a family in the church that needs bread on their table. And so the widow's fast, the fruit of fasting here is that we actually have a concern for those around us. Our eyes are open to the physical needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we fast and we go without some food or we go without that car or that gadget, it frees up financial resources or time so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. And the body of Christ is built up through that act of fasting. Uh, the next um, fruit of fasting we find there is in verse 8. To allow God's light to break forth like the morning. Sometimes when we have to make a major decision in life, we're not quite sure where God is leading. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah? No? Yeah? Somebody says, no, I had a young lady once said that um, God has told me that you're going to be my husband. Okay? And I... Sorry? Yeah, she, she said that. And, and I kind of thought, oh, that's interesting. And she said, and God has told me that I'm not going to have any children. So that means God doesn't want you to have children. I said, well, you know, that's kind of interesting. But you know, when God reveals that to me, then maybe we'll get married. But until then, you know, we're not going down this path at all. Okay? Um, but fasting, when, when there's a lack of clarity about a decision, fasting is a great way to, to, to actually sharpen our thinking and to uh, heighten our perception of God's will. So if you have a heavy meal, you normally want to sleep afterwards, is that right? If you fast for 24 hours, what happens to your body physiologically? Okay, your breath stinks, your urine stinks, you feel irritable, you're detoxing from the body. When you get to 48 hours in a fast, your brain starts to feel really sharp, I mean sharper than it's ever felt before. If you fast for 72 hours, your brain is as sharp as a knife. You may feel a bit lightheaded, but your brain is as sharp as a knife and your ability to perceive things, your sense of discernment is so much sharper than if you just had a heavy meal. And so the Apostle Paul, when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, and he goes into Damascus and he goes into the house, he doesn't ask to be baptized straight away, does he? He fasted for three days because he had a decision to make. Was he going to be an apostle of Jesus or a persecutor of the church? He had to make a big decision. And before he made that decision, he fasted and prayed for three days. And so one of the fruits of fasting here is that God's light will break forth like the morning is we fast in order to bring a clearer perspective and insight as we make decisions. And um, has anybody ever done this yourselves? You fasted when you have a major decision to make? Yes? Um, did you sense God kind of leading you as, as you fasted? Is somebody nodding back here? Yes? Was that your experience, sister? Yes? Um, you know, when I was going back to Minnesota, we spoke about this earlier today, my wife and I were fasting until we made a decision. And we said, God, we're going to fast and pray until you open one door and you close the other doors. And we fasted and prayed until the doors to Britain and Ireland closed and the door to Minnesota swung a little bit wider. So then we, we accepted the call to Minnesota. But we didn't just accept that call because we wanted to go to America. We accepted the call because we were praying and fasting until God made it clear which door was open and which door was closed. So fasting, the fruit of fasting here is that um, we allow God to shed light into the decisions that we're looking to make. Verse 8, another fruit of fasting, that your healing, your health shall spring forth. 
otherwise known as the Daniel fast. Daniel fasted for 10 days in Daniel 1. It wasn't a complete fast. He went back to the original diet that God gave us in the Garden of Eden. That was a sign of allegiance to God. He wasn't going to offer, eat the food offered to the Babylonian idols because that would say I'm dependent upon the Babylonian gods for my food. Daniel uses the same word that is used in Genesis 1 for the food that God gave us. So Daniel says, I'm, it's not a matter of vegetarianism here, though that is part of the story. Daniel is saying, my choice of food shows my allegiance to God. And he chooses a diet that brings him physical health. So one of the fruits of fasting is actually that you, you improve your physical health, as did Daniel. A secondary fruit of fasting here is that your choice of food shows where your allegiance lies spiritually. Okay? You show your allegiance to God by what you eat. And Daniel has a partial fast. And that partial fast, the food he uses, the words he uses, is what, is what God gives us for our diets there in Genesis chapter 1. He's going back and saying, God is my creator. My food comes from his hand. I'm not going to eat from the hand of the king of Babylon. So we fast in order to have a healthier life, a clearer mind, or for physical healing. Two more fruit of fasting here. In verse 8, it says that your righteousness shall go before you. He says uh, there in verse 8, your vindication or your righteousness shall go before you. What does this mean? Um, when John the Baptist crossed the River Jordan to preach, what was John the Baptist eating before he crossed the River Jordan? Locusts and wild honey, yeah? He wasn't eating a regular diet, was he? It was locusts and wild honey. And you see, he was fasting before, it was a partial fast, before he entered into combat for God, before he crossed the River Jordan to proclaim the arrival of the Messiah, John the Baptist was fasting. And uh, if you are doing an evangelistic series, or you're doing a health expo, or you have a Bible study coming up that you know is going to be tricky, you can look at this and say, well, the problem, one of the fruits of fasting is that your righteousness, that God's righteousness will go before you. You fast before that event, so you allow the righteousness of God to go before you. And so, if you're having an evangelistic series, if you're having um, a home study series, whatever it is you're doing for evangelism, it's a healthy thing to actually gather a group of people to pray and fast for the days beforehand, that God's righteousness will go before you, that you're not fighting the battle in your own armor, but God is going to fight this battle for you. So that's one of the fruits of fasting, that our testimony and our witness for Jesus will burn brighter. And then the final fruit of fasting there is in verse 8. It says that the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That is, God will protect us from the attacks of Satan. A good example of this in, in the Bible is in Esther chapter 4 and 5, where um, when God's people were under attack from Naaman, do you remember the story? Esther called for a three-day fast. Remember that? And she said, we're going to pray and fast for three days. Then I'm going to go into the king and speak to him. He says, and she says, and if I perish, then what? I perish. But before she went into the king, she had all God's people pray and fast because everybody's life was on the line. Naaman had, the king had issued a death sentence against the Jews. Everybody needs to pray and fast. We're not going to respond with bullets or swords or spears. We're going to respond through prayer and fasting. And that's how God's people responded in that Esther fast. And so um, when we fast, as we see in these, this, this chapter here, there's, there are many spiritual fruit of fasting. It's not just that you're not eating, but you fast in certain circumstances in order that God might be glorified. So if you say, I don't see God at work in my life very much, well, one of the devotional habits I'd encourage for you to practice or to start practicing is to fast. To fast when you're under attack. To fast when you're trying to break that depression. To fast when there's dispute in the church and you want God to bring a spirit of reconciliation, unity. When you fast and humble yourself, you're saying, God, we cannot fix a problem in human strength, so this can only be fixed in your strength and in your might alone. And then you start to see God working. So it's not that you fast every day and you see God giving you this fruit every day, but most people live lives that go from crisis to crisis or from difficult moments to difficult moments. And it's in those difficult moments, those major decisions, those junction points in life, where God is inviting us to fast and to slow down and to allow God do what only God can do. So, um, what's the time, brother? 25-2, 25 to. 25 to. okay, thank you. So, a short mission story. Some of you know this story. About five years ago in Guinea, we have a school and uh, mission school, we have about 800 Muslim students there, and it's a big source of baptisms. And it's the fastest growing Adventist community in the whole country of Guinea, goes around that school. You've been there, yes? You know the school? 
is pretty run down in places, yes? But it produces baptisms. Absolutely, Absolutely yes. Yeah. So, um, sorry, this late sister here was, was with us for six months out there. Yeah. Yes, it's pretty grim in Guinea at times, yes? Damp, yes. not much electricity, yes. if at all, yes. So, in, in Guinea, so we got this letter from the Young Muslim Men's Association of this city saying, we're going to give you 10 days. 10 days and you have to stop praying in the name of Jesus and stop having Bible classes. Because these are Muslim students. We're giving you 10 days or else. So what do you do? Do you go out and hire armed guards? Well, you could do that, but we didn't do that. What we did was in the office, we said, they've given us 10 days, so we're going to call a 10-day fast. And we're going to fast for 10 days and ask God to be glorified in Guinea. We closed the school on that first day. We're being threatened. We're not going to ask God in 10 days we want to open the school again. There's a lot of financial investments in running a school. But that wasn't our prayer. Our prayer was that God, may you be glorified in Guinea. And whatever that looks like is up to you. Because you can do far more than we can imagine. So we went to the Department of Education the next day. And we said, we have a problem, and we have all these like hundreds and hundreds of students on the streets, and they've got nowhere to go. And the Department of Education, it's a francophone country, um, but we'll forgive them for that. Uh, they, they said, well, in the French education system, you're supposed to go to school on Sabbath morning. So now we're going to expect you to go to school on Sabbath morning, as and when you open the school, and we don't want you to hold morning worships, because this is a secular country, and well, it's actually a Muslim country, but the schools aren't supposed to promote any kind of religion. So now we have the Department of Education and the Muslims Association saying no prayers in the name of Jesus, no morning worship, no Bible classes, and you must have classes on Sabbath. So we're going to get backed in a corner. So we continued praying and fasting. We had a spreadsheet in the office. It was on Google Docs. Everybody had to sign up for some time of those 10 days to pray and fast. So around the clock, we had people praying and fasting. And um, about the third or fourth day, the parents came. They were really upset about this. And why are you closing the school? And we explained why. We said, this is an Adventist mission school. And even though you're Muslims, you've all signed a paper that says, we know it's an Adventist school. We're happy for it to be run on Adventist principles. So we said to the parents, we'll go and speak to the local department of education about it. So they went off and had a big protest. And uh, we felt very good about that. But it didn't solve the problem. And then on the ninth day, we had this delegation from the government Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Education. Were you there at the time? No. Just after that. Okay. So the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Interior came down. They investigated the school and they held a press release. And a, um, like a, um, a press release, no, um, a press conference. Yeah, sorry. It's late in the day. So we held, they held a press conference and they said the, the average high school graduation rate in Guinea is about 20, 25%. The Adventist school here is over 95%. It's the highest average high school leaving rate, graduation rate in the country, this Adventist school. And we're asking the Adventists to open the school tomorrow as an Adventist school. Not as a Muslim school, not as a Catholic school, not as a secular school, but as an Adventist school. And so this went out across the country. People saw it on TV. And so we were praying that God be glorified in Guinea. We didn't ask God in our fasting that just help us reopen the school or protect our missionaries. We said, God, may you be glorified and whatever that looks like, it's in your hands. And we opened our school again on the 10th day and all the students came back and um, we had an evangelistic series about two weeks later. So let's strike while the iron is hot. We had about 20 Muslims were baptized in that city. We had an overt evangelistic series among Muslims, which you don't always do or you rarely do. We had a lot of baptisms. You see, God was glorified in that situation. We prayed and fasted not for the school to be open, but that God be glorified. And when you put things in God's hands, he can do more for us than we can begin to imagine. We never would have dreamt for a public statement from the government on how great our school was, but that's what they gave us. And the school opened and everybody knew this is an Adventist school and it has the blessing of the government. So when we fast, you don't fast every day as a devotional habit, um, but you may be facing a crisis in your church of gossip, you may be facing a crisis in your marriage, you may be facing a health crisis in your life, you may be experiencing a major decision in your life, uh, a financial investment, something to do with your children maybe, um, something to do with your own health. You may be facing a major decision as you're here at the camp meeting. And I want to encourage you that when you're facing those kinds of decisions, um, to actually spend time in prayer and fasting. Maybe have somebody you trust to pray and fast with you. 
And when you fast, fasting is not an endurance sport and it's not meritorious. It doesn't earn you any salvation. Um, there's no merit in fasting for 100 days as opposed to five. In the Bible, you find there is fasting that lasts for one day, for three days, for one week, for a month, or 40 days. You find that Moses did an absolute fast. That is no food and no water for 40 days on Mount Sinai. And I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, okay? I just wouldn't recommend it. Um, but a, a regular fast in the Bible was simply drinking water, taking a liquid, but not eating foods. Now, some people, they may be hyperglycemic or they may be diabetic. You need to control your blood sugar. Um, it's kind of standard war, you know, warning. Consult your doctor before you do something like this. But a partial fast may be suitable for you rather than a full fast. Um, God doesn't give you brownie points depending on whether it's a full fast or a brownie fast, uh, a partial fast. Not a brownie fast. You may fast from brownies, but okay. But uh, a partial fast, um, as, as Daniel did in Daniel chapter 1. A partial fast means that you go without certain food categories for a certain period of time. So a, a good example of a partial fast would be just to eat um, fruit for three days. Fruit and water. Um, and, and taking away the carbs and the proteins and everything else, just going on a fruit diet for three days is immensely healthy for you physically. I'm sure you guys can testify to that in your ministry. But it's, if you're not able to do a full fast, then a partial fast like that is, is absolutely fine with God. Um, fasting enables us to overcome food addictions, give our digestive system a rest, it lowers blood cholesterol, lowers blood pressure, relief from arthritis, we lose body mass and weight, and we help our bodies fight cancer. It also contributes to improved mental health. It calms our minds, helps us focus on our priorities. It clears our, our mind of, bio, of chemical impurities. It elevates our thought patterns, and it provides an important component in the treatment of a variety of mental health disorders. Fasting has many spiritual benefits, and it has many phys physiological benefits. When Jesus spoke to us in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, he said, whenever you pray, yes, remember that? He taught us how to pray. He said, and whenever you fast, and whenever you give alms. Jesus assumes in the Sermon on the Mount that his disciples are people who pray, who give to the poor, and who fast. Jesus doesn't command us how often to pray, to, to fast, but he does say that when you fast, this is how I want you to do it. That you do it in a way that not everybody knows. You're not kind of gaining brownie points in public. You get your reward from people if you're fasting in public. So Jesus assumes that his followers are people who fast. So I want to encourage you today, if, if, you, if fasting isn't a part of your walk with God, consider making it from this camp meeting on a part of your walk with God. And you can download all this material at missionconvention.com. All this stuff is up there. Um, I know loaded up there on the website. So you can download it. You can see all this information for yourselves. Um, I would encourage you, as well as setting aside devotional time with God, um, there are times in your life, and it's not every week, but there are times in your life when you're facing a decision or a problem when the healthiest thing spiritually is to fast and give the problem into God's hands. And when you give the problem into God's hands, you see God do more for you than you would otherwise imagine was a possible outcome to that, that, the situation that you were facing. So fasting is an important part of our walk with God. Yes, sister. Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Isn't that the first part? We've got children. How do you help your children to do their devotions? How do I encourage the children to fast? No, do their devotions from the first half of your lecture. Oh. Well, we, we, you know, some children take to devotions at an early age. Um, I've got a little daughter who likes to read in her room. And she reads books about horses and ponies and girls. And there's, a, there's a whole market of that, apparently. But she also reads the Bible for herself. And she's kind of that way inclined. Um, my boy doesn't read the Bible on his own in his room. But we have a regular family worship every evening. Where we read a passage of scripture. And then we discuss it as a family. And so um, what we're doing is we're developing habits in our children. Habits that will, by God's grace, when they leave home, they'll continue with those habits. So I don't say to my boy, you must do this every morning. Because he's a teenager and he doesn't want to get up in the morning. I mean, that's the truth. Um, but we always have a family worship and the expectation is everybody participates meaningfully in that. And um, so he knows that part of life is, is having a daily act of worship. And if he doesn't do it himself in the morning, which I know he doesn't, 
Um, as a teenage boy, I'm not going to drag him out of bed at five in the morning saying, read your Bible, because you know, he's kind of like a bear with a sore head at that time. You know? um, but we have an act of worship in the evening. We gather together, read the Bible, study together. And so you know, we're, setting a, we're setting our children an, an example. And when he gets up in the morning, he sees if I'm praying in my room. And so he sees what my wife does and sees what I do, and we set that example for him. So I don't require my 16-year-old boy to read the Bible every morning, but he is required to be part of the family worship every day, and that's not something we have to force. He, he willingly participates in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, setting a good example is a healthy thing. There are many parents that I know, they come to church and drop their children off at Sabbath school, and then they go home. Um, and we as parents need to set a godly example to our children that our children, that they copy us. And sometimes I say things and think, man, that sounds just like my father 40 years ago. And I'm horrified that my father has an influence in that certain way, like the tone of voice maybe. And uh, when we train up a child in the way they should go, that means that we set an example in how we live our lives and that they know that we're praying for them. They see that we're reading our scriptures and our, and our own private devotions and they, because Christianity is more caught than taught, then they, they catch that vision for themselves. Yeah, thank okay. you. So, do you have any comments on fasting? No? Yes, Craig? I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that it's almost one o'clock, and we're about to have our lunch, so, yes. So, if you fast in your question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Craig is saying that when you fast for three days, what happens? Yeah. I said, when I, I fast for uh, two to three days, mm -hmm. I get that mental clarity mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you walk past a tree or something, you can actually smell the tree. It's like, oh, it's a tree, I can smell it. Mm -hmm. Where you don't smell it any other time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've never smelt a tree, but mm, I believe you. Yeah. No. Okay. So Craig wants you all to know that he doesn't hug trees. He's not a tree hugger, but he does smell the trees. Uh, that's important to know, Craig. Yes. Um, but I think that on a serious note, what Craig is talking about is that when you fast, Craig, you have a, you, your, your intellect is much sharper. Your perception of what is happening around you is much sharper as well. And you are much more open to outside influences. And it's not just the smell of the, 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 the trees, but you're much more open to the voice of the Holy Spirit when your voice is that sharp. Yes. All right, so we've covered today, um, after a little introduction, we've covered um, two devotional habits. We've covered um, a devotional time with God, spending time with God. We've also touched on the devotional habits of fasting. I just want to emphasize again that not everybody practices this. There's no... You don't get into heaven a day quicker because you do practice it. You don't get into heaven a day slower because you don't practice it. But if you want to experience God in your life and to see his hand in your life, um, these are two very helpful devotional habits that you can practice. The devotional time every day, the fasting from time to time, where you start to sense God's presence in your life. But at the bottom line of this is we have to be intentional. If you're not intentional about this, it doesn't happen. You have to get up and spend that time with God or carve out that time with him. If you're going to fast, believe me, you have to be very intentional about that. You can't just come home. I can't just come home and say, my wife's got a nice meal for me and say, oh, honey, I'm fasting today. I mean, that's not a good, that's not a good plan, okay? Um, if you're going to fast in your family, you need to kind of discuss it with the family and say, when are we going to do this? When is a good time for us all to do it? And if my boy has got a, a big exam tomorrow, I'm not going to ask him to fast the whole day today because he's a teenager and he's going to be like a bear with a sore head tomorrow morning and he's not going to think well in his exam. So if you're going to fast or you're going to spend time with God, it requires intentionality. Beyond whatever else you do, you have to be intentional about this walk with God. The same as in a marriage. If you're intentional about nurturing your marriage, it will grow. If you neglect nurturing your marriage, it doesn't grow, it, it fades away. And it's the same with our walk with God. If, we don't, if we're not intentional about nurturing our walk with God, that walk fades away. And one day we wake up and we discover that there's no more connection with God. And that kind of breaks our heart. 
So just as we nurture our relationships, we nurture our relationships with our children, we nurture our relationships with our spouse, so we need to nurture our relationship with God. And if there's one thing you take away from this morning, it's please be intentional about your walk with God. And that intentionality manifests itself in different devotional habits. Tomorrow, we're going to look at various meditation and devotional readings of Scripture in the second hour. In the first hour, we're going to be looking at um, how we gain lessons from nature, walking with a spiritual companion, and also um, the devotional habit of praise, which is a very important devotional habit for us. It's something that we can practice on every single day, and everybody can engage in that as well. We're going to look at how we do that and what are the spiritual benefits of it. So thank you for spending this time with me this morning. It's been my privilege to stand here before you, and um, hopefully some of you will be back here tomorrow at um, 9... Oh, yeah, tomorrow's Sabbath, yes, okay. So Sunday at 9.45 we start again for an hour and a half, and then we finish at 1 o'clock on Sunday with the last of these seminars. Let's bow our heads, and we'll close with prayer. <clears throat> our dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you that you yearn for our presence. As a Heavenly Father, you delight to hear from your children. And Father, I pray that as we go through this camp meeting, as, as we return to our homes on Sunday or Monday, I ask, Father, that our walk with you will be stronger, that we will start to see you more and more active in our lives, that we'll hear your Spirit whispering gently to us, this is the way, walk ye in it, that we will know that you are active around us, that we will see your hand, and we will have a sense of peace in our hearts, knowing that you are going before us and you are hedging us in to our sides and behind us. So, Father, as we break now for our midday meal, I pray your blessing upon us as we fellowship together. May our time together be sweet as we visit the booths this afternoon and learn what all the ministries are doing. I pray that there will be a spirit of love and harmony amongst us, and that as we learn that we, can, we will also be a blessing one to another. So give us, uh, dismiss us now with your blessing and with the presence of your spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.